Hello and welcome. Well, the art of storytelling has been around since time began. And as long that there has been people, there have been stories handed down from generation to generation. And as far back as ancient Egyptian civilizations, and even here in Australia with Aboriginal art cave paintings that date back thousands of years. You know, stories are a part of every culture around the globe. And without knowing it, we really are surrounded by them each and every day. That being through songs on the radio, movies, television, podcasts, you name it. So like when you think about it, you know, a storyteller really holds the key that connects us straight to our emotions. And with that power, they can actually make an imprint on our hearts and our minds. You know, they really have the ability to capture our imagination and to transport us to another place. And what a gift that really is. And today we welcome a wonderful storyteller, Alex Richin, a public speaker, a writer and advocate. Alex um, writes for leading publications and speaks all around the world on issues relating to foreign and national affairs, religious conflict, and is a a regular commenter on TV and radio. Now, he's um, worked for uh, a member of the state legislature and a researcher um, and also had practiced law at two of the world's largest law firms, uh, first in Sydney and then in London. Now he is an author of two books and now, really exciting to say, a children's book, uh, A uh, A New Day. Now thank you so much for joining us, Alex. How are you doing? I'm great, Rachel. Thanks for having me on. You know what, um, we know you're a busy man and thanks for your time. You know, but sort of going to what I was saying just earlier on about storytelling, you know, telling stories really um, is a large part of what makes us um, as human beings connect to each other. I'd love to know what your thoughts are initially sort of on, on this, on this thought. Well, I, I agree with you entirely. And I'm someone who believes in the power of words to disseminate ideas and to move people and to help people. And in sitting parent to child, grandparent to grandchild, and telling stories. It's very much how I was raised, having come from a non-English speaking background. My family is from the Soviet Union and my parents and grandparents were always intent on me having some awareness of where I'd come from. And that was instilled and imparted through storytelling, exactly as you described, by sitting with my parents and grandparents and hearing firsthand what they lived through, what their experiences were. Mm. And that's something I've tried to then pass on to my children. So I I totally uphold everything that you said. I think it's a fundamental part of our society and in shaping people, the way that we convey stories to each other. Yeah. And it's, you know, I guess the power of storytelling um, in in an instance where it's in a book is, you know, it's far more than just reading words um, out loud, I guess, you know, and and an author, as I said before, has the ability to almost like provide us with a lens to look through um, to, you know, and gives us the ability to to control what we see and we feel. um, And they, they also also just give us a bit of a path as to what, what, what they want us to be able to, I don't, I don't, I don't know, picture it in our mind. It's a pretty powerful yeah. thing, don't you think? Yeah, it is. It is. And it's also a way not merely of conveying a story, but the ideas and the values mm. and the virtues that are within that story. Um, yes. And that really is the purpose of storytelling. And you spoke about it in your introduction, its origins in ancient Egypt and among our Indigenous Australians. I mean, the purpose of telling stories isn't merely to entertain, it's to convey values and to pass on ethics from generation to generation. Um, And that's really the power of words and the power of storytelling. Yes. What else do you love love about it, I guess? Is there anything else? Uh, Look, I love the way that it connects people. You know, I love the way that it, it, it can connect, in my circumstances, a father to a child, uh, you know, parents to grandparents and communities as well. Um, there's something within that, within the ability to sit together, to convey ideas, to share ideas, to learn, to listen. That's really something about human development and growth and the growth of the society. And it's something that I've always cherished. And in the first two books that I wrote, they were on a completely different topic to this. They were on much kind of weightier, more serious topics about uh, conflict and politics and history. Um, but really the reasoning behind writing my first two books is identical to why I wrote this book, this kid's book. And it's about conveying ideas and telling stories and moving people and affecting people. That's mm-hmm. really what it's all about, regardless of what the genre or the subject is. Mm-hmm. And now you're a father of is it three children? 
You've got three three kids. girls, yeah. Three yeah. girls. <laughs> um, yeah. Congratulations, of course. Um, Thank and you. with that, you know, storytelling is, is a very part, a very big part of everyone's childhood as well. So, like, why do you think it's such an important part of um, children's lives as well? I think that you know we're desperate when we speak to our children for them to understand their circumstances, to be well adjusted to their surrounds, for them to develop good values you know, the values that we hold dear that were instilled in us. And for me, it's about a love of family, a love of community, a love of nature, uh, the importance of resilience and hard work. These are the things that I really value the most. And when I tell stories, I don't tell them merely for the purpose of spouting words into the air. It's to try and find ways to convey those values. And storytelling gives you a medium, a forum, uh, a creative way in which you can impart those values which is so much more effective than merely just stating them and restating them. Um, yes. Particularly with young children who learn through imagination and visualization. And it makes storytelling not merely uh, a way of connecting to children and a way of entertaining children and holding their attention, but it's a way that we control their development and their growth. Beautifully said. Now, here at Kidipedia, um, we were really fortunate enough to publish your article and the title is uh, A New Day Will Come, but a pretty special one is right here. Now, for someone who hasn't read the article, can you give us a little bit of an overview of what it's about and just tell us what inspired you to write it? Well, it really talks about, you know, the circumstances in which we all find ourselves now through the coronavirus pandemic. And when everything first hit in our country, and I think we need to recognize that we as a country have been quite fortunate compared with places around the world. Mm -hmm. But even so, even though we've experienced it fairly mildly compared with other places, seeing within a space of a few weeks, this thing move from being something distant and affecting people overseas to suddenly affecting where we can go, whether we can leave our homes, where we can shop, who we can interact with, how we interact. Uh, it led to a complete breakdown of the way we live our lives, really. Mm -hmm. And it made, made me personally realize that, you know, I'd constructed this life for myself based on routine and ritual and repetition, going to the gym, going to work, interacting with people, shaking hands, things like that, things that you take entirely for granted. And suddenly it all crumbles to nothing. And my feeling to that, you know, my response to that emotionally in the first couple of weeks, I was... Um, it made me a little bit anxious and unsettled. Uh, and then I thought about my children, you know, my three young girls who are kind of dealing with the same thing as well, being unable to go to school, unable to, you know, hug their school friends, see their grandparents, continue with their activities. And I thought, if I feel anxious and unsettled because my routine has crumbled, how much worse could my children be affected? Mm -hmm. um, and that's what compelled me to write the story, to really, again, to go back to what we were discussing before, to impart those values and convey those ideas. And those ideas, and that was beautifully captured in the article published on the Kidipedia site, is that, you know, a new day will come. You know, when things return to some sort of normal, uh, we should be optimistic and resilient and hopeful and look forward to that better day. But at the same time, we should pause and appreciate what we have. Take hope and solace in life's simple pleasures, whether it be the love of our family, you know, family pets, the, the security and comfort we feel in the family home. Uh, th these are things which remain available to us. Um, and through difficult times such as this and through other difficult times which families will experience, I think it's always vital to retain those universal truths, you know, about what truly matters in life, what's trivial and what's important. And these are the things I try to convey in this book. Yes. I'd love to be able to read... Um just a couple of the paragraphs that I think um, really, really support what you've just said. Um, and I think it are really beautifully written as, as is your book, you. of course. Um, so this is quoting you from the article. It may be that once this terrible virus passes, we will quickly slip back into the routine of old um, and will emerge as self-absorbed as we ever were. This book was written not only to help children through difficult times, but to hold on to the good that has come from a miserable situation. It aims to foster resilience and a sense of hope and optimism in our children and ourselves. And it seeks to remind us all, uh, not just during the crisis, what is really important in life. And as I said before, that is really beautifully said. So why do you think Thank this you. message is so important? I think it really goes to 
to the essence of a happy life and a life of meaning and purpose. I mean, so often we get bogged down in trivial things. You know, we concern ourselves and fret over things which are really unimportant. And it takes a crisis like this where we're suddenly deprived of so much to make us realize what really counts in life and what is irrelevant and, and shouldn't really trouble us. And as I said in those words that you quoted, I have a feeling that humans being as you know, set in our ways and hardwired as we tend to be and stubborn as we are, that I think that once this passes, we'll very quickly slide back into our old ways. But some good has come from a miserable situation. And that good is that sense of perspective. And I really hope that when this passes, we can hold on to it. Because to me, that's the essence of leading, you know, a productive, contented existence. And also getting through difficult times, you know, bereavement and challenges at work and in the family environment, you know, understanding what really counts in life and what's unimportant is really, really important to me. And it's something that I've tried to convey to my children over and over again. And here arose a teachable moment, an opportunity to really convey that in a way that I felt they could understand. And I hope families around the world can understand. Um, and that was really the purpose of the book and of the article. Do you think there will be a big paradigm shift after this? Or as you said, it will only sort of just be some people? Or, or, or do you think all people in some part of themselves will have some form of a, a shift and a change? Look, it, it, it depends on the individual. I think that some people are holding out hope that there'll be big societal ch shifts, structural changes in the way we interact, in the way we work, in the way our economy is directed. I don't think that will happen personally. Um, but I think each of us can make changes in our own lives. And I've been thinking now that the restrictions are coming off and life is starting to return to normal. I've been giving a lot of thought to what I actually enjoyed about the lockdown um, and what elements of that that I can now carry on into my life going forward. Um, and I've enjoyed the fact that I spoke about that anxiety I felt at the beginning, but once things kind of settled down and I accepted my new condition, um, I enjoyed working from home and having more time to spend with my children. Um, I enjoyed being unburdened by plans that I don't really want to do mm. and places that I don't want to go and wasting my time in shopping malls and things like that and just being in the home and doing the things that are important to me. Um, and I think it's a burden and an obligation on each of us to pause and reflect and think about what things we've learned from this crisis and that we can carry forward into our lives. I think it's the onus is on us as individuals to do that. Yeah. And um, as we mentioned before, in the past, you've written two other novels on the topics of history and politics. Um, as a question, you know, how, how, or is there any connection between the two and how did you come to then write the children's book? I mean, is there any correlation between the messages with the other two books? Or, and it's fine if there isn't, but as a general question. Uh, look, I, I can't say that there's a, a direct message. I mean, the topic of my first book was about um, Middle East politics. My second book is about history, uh, specifically the history of the Jewish people. Um, and this book is obviously about what we've discussed, about finding hope and resilience and appreciating life's simple pleasures during the pandemic and, and going forward. So there's no thematic connection between them. But as I said at the outset, you know, I believe very much in debate, in discussion, in imparting ideas. And certainly all three of these books are about that. They say something. They're not written for the sake of it. They're, they're, they're books which hold opinions and I believe hold values. Um, and I think that in all of my writing, and I've written a lot in you know, newspaper articles and journals about aspects of history, dark aspects of history and positive ones as well. And it's all about telling a story and conveying ideas and showing people what's important. So that I think is the common thread that runs through all my work. Mm. So talking about um, the children's book and you day, I'll sort of hold that up to the screen. It's a beautiful story of hope, love, um, I guess, and always finding the positive. So it's a book that I guess that was written not only to help children through difficult times, but to hold on to the good, like we'll say before, that's come out of a miserable situation. Um, and you wrote the book to bring comfort um, and happiness and strength to families. Like, why do you think this, this, these messages are so important at this moment? I just think that, you know, it's such a difficult time. And again, we in Australia have been quite fortunate and my family, despite being affected, um, is in a particularly fortunate position. We have uh, a loving, stable family and a fairly comfortable home. But when writing this book, I thought not only of my family, but of 
families around the world who are doing it really tough. Um, families who have unstable home environments and don't have a loving, nurturing system around them um, or who are struggling financially as well. And a crisis like this can really push them over the brink. And I'm not proposing that my book can help them in, in any meaningful way in that regard if they're really suffering. But I was hoping that this book for all families around the world, regardless of their circumstances, would just bring them some momentary respite and relief and joy. Um, I think that regardless of one's circumstances, to have a mind that's conditioned to think positively and hopefully and optimistically, to be resilient, to envisage a better day, I think that's a very valuable thing in all circumstances. Mm. Um, so that's, that's how I hoped it would help people. But also, as we've discussed, to also give that sense of perspective, to really ask people to pause and to consider what's around them in their life that truly matters and brings them joy and happiness. In my experience, it's the simple things in life that give the truest, um, most long-lasting happiness. And to give effect to that, I included at the back of this book a diary section yes, where I'll kids show. can thank you, where kids can also reflect on what they're thankful for and how they've been spending their days, and mm -hmm. they can write a note. That's the page on there now. A note to their future selves, um, and that's something else which I think can really help children and families through this time to be able to think about what they're feeling and write it down. And also once this all passes 10, 20, 30 years from now, I think families will look back and have this book as a historical record of what it was like to live through a truly extraordinary time in human history. Yes. And I mean, the, the messages in the book really can be used for anyone going through any difficult times. So it's not just the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, do, I mean, do you think that... It, those messages are sort of relevant for anyone going through any hardship in their life? Yeah, I, I certainly believe that. I really do. I, I believe that, you know, on, on a good day and bad in a time of crisis or in an ordinary time in our lives, the way that we approach things, the way that we approach problems, the way that we deal with trauma and hardship um, depends so much on our own mindset and our own conditioning. And if we are hopeful, if we are resilient, if we are mentally strong, um, if we are such that we can look forward to a better day and envisage a better day, even in a bleak and dark time. Um, and this is something that's come through. I mean, my book isn't revolutionary in that regard. Like, for example, a book that I enjoyed reading as a child was A Diary of Anne Frank, a very tragic story about a girl who ended up you know, dying during the Holocaust. But you read that diary, and it's applicable not merely to that time, but it's universal in that it encourages people to look out the window and see hope even in the most bleak and miserable times. And my book, while I'm, I don't wish to make any comparisons, I think it plays on similar themes about being hopeful, about looking forward to a better day, imagining a better future, uh, and then creating that future to the extent that we can. Mm. I've used the example of um, Anne Frank um, in just sort of like personal conversations to people, just when people have been complaining um, about being um, home in isolation. And, and when you think back to, to times using that example, um, when there was, yeah. um, was it 17 people, I think, within a, such a small amount of space. And it was, yeah. um, I can't remember the amount of days, but it was um, an incredible length of time that they, they were in that yeah. scenario. We, we've had the, the luxury of <laughs> being in our homes, electricity, water, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, um, sort of on, uh, internet streaming services like Netflix. We've <laughs> yes, we, yes. Very it's, true. It, it, so do you really think that um, this is a tough question for anyone to, to I guess, to, to maybe to come to terms with, but do you think in that respect that we have become in, in that, in that instance, become quite entitled as, as a society um, overall? I, I think that's a very good observation. And that's, what, that's where it comes down to, again, perspective. And while we have been deprived of a great deal, and I don't think we should underestimate how challenging it is for people who are used to a certain way of living, for that to immediately and suddenly grind to a halt and to be told, you can't go to a certain place. You can't have physical contact with people. Mm. Um, you know, it's caused a lot of economic suffering for people who are particularly small business owners. Um, so I don't think that should be underestimated, but you're quite right. At the same time, when you have that historical perspective, yes. if you pause and actually look at what we have, what we're equipped with to deal with this crisis, you know, we have a strong economy that can withstand 
a crisis like this, you know, um, our shelves are stocked apart from a, a brief period there at the beginning where certain pasta types and toilet papers were hard to come by, but overwhelmingly we want for nothing. You can get whatever you need. Mm-hmm. You can get things ordered into the home. As you said, we've never had as much option for entertainment to keep us, you know, occupied in the home. So I think having that sense of perspective and that sense of calm um, and realizing that really things aren't that bad. We, we are deprived of certain things, but we can look around and appreciate the things that we have, the things that really are meaningful. Um, I think that really helps deal with, the, with this sort of a situation. Mm. And what lessons do you hope that children would learn from the book? Well, I hope that it's about, you know, they can learn to appreciate things exactly as you've described. Um, appreciate how fortunate they are in their lives um, and appreciate also distinguish between what is truly meaningful and important in life and what is trivial and meaningless and mm-hmm. material possessions um, and, you know, wandering around shopping malls. These things don't matter. Um, but appreciating nature, going for a walk, which we weren't allowed to do in the early days of the lockdown. This is something to be cherished. The love of family, the comfort we feel in a secure family home. This is something to be valued and to be replicated. Um, these are the things I hope children will take away from this book that perspective and that sense of hope as well. Mm. And what do you think children will we um, remember from the, the COVID-19 era overall? Uh, look, I think a lot depends on their individual circumstances and, um, and what their parents have imparted to them. I think for those who have had a family members perhaps fall ill, uh, they won't remember it as, as a happy time as, as this book tries to impart. For those who have really suffered financially, then it will be remembered as a miserable time and with, with good reason. Um, but for the overwhelming majority of Australian families who probably haven't been overly affected by it, um, I hope that this book will allow them to take away some positive memories even from this situation, from having lived through a period of turmoil and crisis and maybe emerged better and stronger uh, and with a greater sense of perspective and life from it. Mm. And... In saying that, I guess in the last few months, you know, everyone's really seen a massive sh- shift across the world and our lives had completely changed. Um, thankfully, we are sort of starting to sort of um, come back into what a new sense of normal. But um, yeah. it, um, that said, what messages do you feel compelled uh, to share with parents that can help them um, with a positive perspective, not only um, sort of through this time, but maybe to help them sort of thrive in, in, the, in the future as well? Well, the first thing that I would say is that parents should be acutely aware of what their children might be going through. I think that we get so caught up in our own lives and how we're affected by these things. And I think we take for granted that children are very adaptable and resilient creatures. And we perhaps don't pick up on the cues of how they might be suffering Mm -hmm. in a time like this and and, and their needs. I think also parents will emerge from this with a much better appreciation of teachers and essential workers. I know that in the early weeks of the lockdown, when I tried homeschooling my kids, I mean, it ended in tears within minutes. I found it so difficult. Um, And it led me to really truly appreciate my teachers whose patience must be superhuman. (laughs) Um, So that's something which I hope parents will come away with that understanding of um, how much we rely in our society on teachers, on doctors, nurses, cleaners, services and workers that we so often take for granted. Um, and, and also that appreciation of uh, the need to always be concerned for our children and their mental health and their well-being and to be nurturing and caring and attentive. I think that's really important. And, and hopefully this book, by having parents sit with their kids and read it and perhaps go through the diary sections together, they'll become more in tune with their children and what they're feeling and learn about them and learn from them. There's much we can learn from our children. Yeah. It's been said that, um, you know, when children do express their feelings, it's very important to validate them. Do you think that that's, that's something that's important? I think so. Um, I think it's important that we listen to our children um, and, and we take on board what they're feeling and what they're going through. And we don't seek to overly impose what we think they should feel or how we feel they should act, particularly in a time of crisis and dislocation and instability like this. I think we need to be kind to ourselves and to our children. And that begins with listening to validating, as you've described, um, and allowing them to feel what they're feeling. 
Mm. So for you personally, what change would you like to see in the world sort of moving forward from where we are now? Um, I'd, I'd like changes to be made. I mean, there are various societal changes and structural and economic changes that I think could and should be made. But um, I, I'm a lot more about individual responsibility and people making changes in their own lives. Um, and I think hopefully from this, people will have, I've mentioned this many times, but will have a perspective, um, won't be so petty and self-absorbed uh, and neurotic, but rather will appreciate just the wonders of this world that we live in and by being deprived of certain things um really understanding what's truly important you know valuing mental health and physical activity and health and being able to interact with people the love of the family these are the things i hope will come away with and remember as being truly important so when people go through growth growth is um is, is difficult and I think it can be sort of uncomfortable um, and no doubt people have actually sort of sort of worked their way through that, that shift throughout sort of isolation. And how, in your opinion, um, would you sort of suggest that people that don't want to fall back into their old patterns, that do want to make positive change in their life, do you have any advice for them um, now that they're starting to be on the other side of it, how they could maybe um, make some of those changes? For, for well, one thing that, yeah, one thing that came to me, because I was thinking that the precise thing of how do we, not just in a philosophical, conceptual sense, say that we're going to make changes, but actually implement those do changes, something about identify, it. It, that, that's right. And so I had my wife, you know, together we did this exercise where we wrote down the five things that we've enjoyed about this period of isolation. Um, and now we're going to look at how we can retain those things. Uh, some things won't be possible. So it won't be possible for me to work from home. And my, my wife is currently home on maternity leave. We just had a baby a few months ago. And it's been lovely having everyone in the family home. That won't be able to continue forever. Um, I travel for work and I need to be in the office. But just having that understanding of how lovely it was to be in the home, to have the kids home longer, to be able to spend more time with them, and to be able to then carry those things forward. Um, and... I think sometimes we don't realize how much control we have over our own lives. We kind of feel like things are imposed on us by employers, by friends, by family, by societal expectations. But I hope that if everyone comes to take an exercise like this, where they stop and pause and note the things that they enjoyed about this period and actively think about how they can carry them forward, they can see the responsibility um, and the autonomy they have over their own lives. And then it's a matter of having the willpower and the strength to actually implement those things. But I think it begins with pausing and taking stock of what was different in this period, what we enjoyed and what we want to continue. Mm. So, so you sat down, you wrote, did it have to be the top five things? It could be obviously a longer list. Anyone can just write the list of all the things that, um, that they, they have enjoyed through, throughout this, this period of lockdown. And yeah, then exactly. find ways of implementing that into their lives as we sort of, Come out the other Precisely. Side. Precisely. I mean, this was just an idea that came into my head and I thought the five things would be a way of, you know, focusing on really the most material and the most important things that, that, that we felt and experienced during this time. But people can adapt it and do it in their own ways, long lists or even the, the top one or two things that they want to carry on in their lives from this period. But I think it's the key thing is just, before we rush back into our old ways of going back into the office and, you know, working as we always did and interacting as we did to actually stop and pause and reflect and appreciate that I think is the, the important first step, however people choose to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and getting back to the book for just for a moment, what's um, the response been from the book and the messages in the book so far? Oh, it's been really lovely. I mean, I've had families all around the world sending me photos of, you know, kids and parents reading the book from the United Kingdom and from parts of Europe, because the book's also been translated into Spanish and Italian. So I've had readers in, in those countries and in countries that speak those languages send me photos. And it's just been so heartening and so positive. Um, normally, I'm not a person that really cares about oh, what people think of my work. Um, you know, I, I, I write and I do things because I believe in them. But this was a different project. This was directly designed to help people. And hearing the, the reflections and the comments and feedback of families 
has been really moving, really moving. And um, tell us a little bit about the donations that you make to the Smith. Is it the Smith family as well? It's the Smith family, yeah. So I mentioned at the beginning how, you know, there are so many families that are doing it much harder than, than my family. And at a time of crisis, it really affects those people who are already in a slightly precarious, unstable situation, whether it be uh, in an abusive home or some sort of fractured family environment or because they're in economic hardship a period like this could really push them over the edge. And the Smith family is such an incredible charity. It's a real Australian institution. And in good times and bad, they help the most vulnerable in our society. And I feel like in a period like this, their work is all the more important. And that's why they seem like a natural partner to join with. And I'm really proud that everyone who purchases this book not only will hopefully benefit from it itself, but are also contributing by the Smith family to helping vulnerable families around the country. And you'll provide us with the links where we can actually put them in the show notes to ensure that people that want to purchase the book can um, sort of just be directed to the right place. Um, so they can purchase it at the moment. The easiest way is through book depository or they can purchase signed copies through my personal website, alexwiftion.com. But however they choose to purchase, 10% will go to the Smith family. I'm very proud of that. Well done. It's, 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 it's a beautiful contribution that you're making. Um, Thank you and difference that you're making in the world. Well, it's, it's been a, a wonderful chat today. If you were to summarize, I guess, your key messages for anyone listening, what would they be? Well, the key message is no matter what situation you find in yourself in life, whether it be a period of crisis like we've all experienced now or an ordinary time, always choose to be happy, always choose to be joyful, find love, find happiness and life's simple pleasures. They are the best things that we have. Um, and and be hopeful and be resilient and be strong. Mm -hmm. Alex, thank you so much for your time today. If anyone's got any other questions and or want to get in touch with you in the future, whereabouts can they find you? The best way is through my website, alexrifchin.com, and they can look at all my books and my work and also contact me through the website. I'd be delighted to hear from anyone with questions or who's read the book and has feedback. I'd love to hear from them. Thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you for your wonderful questions. Oh, no, no problem at all. Thank you for your time. Take care. Thank you. Bye.